Good morning to everyone. Let's bow our heads in prayer before we open God's word. Heavenly Father, as we open your word this morning, we recognise that it was authored by the Holy Spirit. And therefore we know it's true, past, present and forever. And we ask that as we open your word, you speak to our hearts and you translate your word for our growth and benefit and you speak to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to continue the series of messages from Second Peter and I'm going to read Second Peter chapter 1. I think we're going to be spending quite a bit of time on chapter 1 of Second Peter. And I read from verse 1 through to um, verse 15. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given, which, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence. Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election secure, your election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it's right that as long as I'm in this tent to stir up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. So, just by way of reminder, we looked at Hebrews chapter 5 and chapter 6 and the importance of a Christian to grow, not to be a babe in Christ. There comes a time when you need to eat solid food instead of drinking milk like a baby. And the danger, if you don't do that, is that you can fall from the faith. In terms of growing, we looked at the verses in this particular chapter that the Apostle Peter writes under the guidance of the Holy Spirit to add to our faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly love, and to brotherly kindness, love. 
these are the things that need to be cultivated in the Christian life for someone to grow. These are the things that touch on character, not activity. They go to who I am, how I am transformed by the Holy Spirit to grow in each of these things that are listed here so I can come to the fullness of knowledge of Jesus Christ. The question that I want to address today is essentially, who am I and why is it important that I grow? Because unless we understand who we are, then things don't make sense. I'm talking about identity here. And the world is full of speaking of identity at the moment, identity politics, fragmentation of people into multiple groups to create increasing division. Now, it's quite clear here from the Word of God that identity really puts people into two categories. All are human beings made in the likeness and image of God, all of equal value. But the identity is separated. There's the children of God, there's the redeemed, there's the saved, those, those who have committed their lives to Christ, and then there's everybody else. For those who claim to be Christians... Your identity and my identity is found in Christ and we need to understand that identity because that identity tells us why all these things are important in terms of growth. There's a couple of the verses that we're going to focus on. Uh, Verses 10, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. And to, from verse 11, so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. Now, in this chapter, Peter tells us very clearly that we have obtained a faith not by our own works, it's been given through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's been given, not worked for. In verse 3 we read that all we need is supplied and given. It's not something that we have to work out or try to develop. It's given to us. We're also told that this precious is a precious faith and we have precious promises. And it says, ultimately, to become partakers of the divine nature. To become partakers of the nature of Christ himself. And then Peter goes on to explain the things that we need to grow in, which we looked at last time. And the result of having this Christian growth is that we're not barren, as we read in, back in, in verse 8. And here the word barren is in Greek gives much more depth. It means we're not inactive, unemployed, lazy, useless, idle or slow. So we're not that. We're not unfruitful. In other words, we're producing fruit. So he puts these things in a negative sense by describing what we shouldn't be to tell us what we should be. So we should be productive, fruitful, engaged in the Christian life. Distinction here, very important distinction. Engaged in the Christian life does not mean activity. It does ultimately lead to activity, but it starts somewhere else. 
Christian life starts with character. When the character is transformed, the fruits of the Spirit are brought forth, as we read in Galatians, and then that leads to activity. Far too many Christians believe and think that the more they do, somehow they are more productive. You can preach ten sermons a week and be completely unproductive and unfruitful if the character of the preacher isn't what God wants. We need to understand that. That's what needs to happen. And then he says, if you lack these things, you're short-sighted even into blindness and have forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Short-sighted. You can't see at a distance. You have no vision about where you're going. All you can see is just what's in front of you. And if you turn behind you, all you can see is what's immediately behind you. You can't see where you came from. And he says that quite clearly. They have forgotten that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So this Christian growth is so important in giving us the far-sightedness and to remember who we were so we can live fruitful and productive lives in Christ. And Peter tells us here Do all this, be diligent in doing this to make your call and election sure. And then you have an abundant entry into the everlasting kingdom. Now here's this continuity that I want to speak about. A continuity and an identity that come together. Far too many Christians professing Christians identify Christianity with the time they were saved, the time they believed, the time they prayed the sinner's prayer, something not found in the Word of God, by the way. And it's as if Christian life started and ended there and then we have this hiatus period where we're going to go into eternity. That doesn't explain the identity of the Christian. Let me speak a little bit about the identity before we start talking about the continuity of life. Who am I and who are you, brother and sister? These are things that the Word of God says that we are. doesn't depend on how we feel. It doesn't depend on our works. It doesn't depend on anything. It's how God sees us and how God treats his people. So if we go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, we read, Peter says, But you, you being all of us, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may claim the praises, and as I mentioned last time, praises here is the virtues, which is the same word used in in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, virtues, aretes in Greek, of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Here's the identity issue that I was reflecting on before. We are different. You are different. I am different. I am a chosen person, part of a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special person and people to God to proclaim his virtues, the one who called us out of darkness into light. Understand that first and foremost. It doesn't matter 
what you think of yourself, God sees you and me as his special people. You know how mind-blowing this is? I look at myself, a broken human being, with weaknesses. And if we were to call it as it is, somebody who has the old nature warring against with a propensity to sin that needs to be put under control. I'm a broken human being, you're a broken human being, and yet God sees us as his special people, a royal priesthood, (coughs) excuse me, a holy nation. Paul puts it a little bit differently. Paul in chapter 6 of Romans and verse 4 talks about the Christian being a person with newness of life. Somebody who was something in the past who's by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour is now a new man. Paul goes to lengths to explain the first man Adam And the last man, Christ. And he explains that we are his people. And if you go to Romans chapter 6 and verse 11, Romans chapter 6 and verse 11, Paul starts explaining, because all I've been saying up until now is who we are. These are what's called indicatives in the word of God they tell us things as they are and then the apostle Paul goes on to give us imperatives things that we must do and what we must do is linked with who we are remember that what we do is linked with who we are and who we claim to be It's no good claiming to be a Christian, identifying as a Christian, creating a Christian worldview that suits you and your lifestyle and the lifestyle of your friends and saying that this is all good. We need to look at what the Word of God says when it says that if you are my people, my holy nation, the new man in Christ, this is what needs to happen. And in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11 we read, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves, consider yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, imperative, what you need to do, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. It doesn't say you're not going to sin. It doesn't say you're not going to fall, although a Christian shouldn't sin. But what it's saying is don't let sin reign over you. Don't let it be your master. Don't let this world rule over you and how you should behave. Because you belong to me. You are part of a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall no long shall not have dominion over you for you are not under law but under grace in other words present your body present yourself as an instrument for righteousness you were who you were the old man has died Despite the fact that it wars within, and perfection will only come the other side of the grave. Despite who we are, 
despite our fallenness and weak and weakness, we are new people in Christ. That's your identity. And if that's your identity from here on in, present your body and everything you have as an instrument of righteousness. And that's why Paul puts it in those terms. Peter puts it in growth terms. This is what you need to do to add to the faith, the precious faith that we've been given. And all these things ultimately translate into becoming partakers of the divine nature and becoming like Christ. Another word for that which we bandy about a lot is holiness. Holiness. Pointing to the end, the abundant entry into the kingdom of heaven, we read in the word of God that without holiness no one will see God. So it's this growth that's necessary Firstly, because of who we are. Secondly, because that's what's required of our new identity. So we can progress and move into the eternal kingdom. All things have been given that pertain to life and godliness. I remind that point. You don't go out and try to do things with your own strength. Everything's been given by God in his love and grace to us. Everything we need is supplied. Make your call and election sure. Doubts. Am I saved? Being tossed around by the world and our own temperament and our own thinking. Combine that with Satan's attack to give and create doubt in people. Christians often suffer from and this particular point here, make your election sure. I'm not getting into theological terms about election. Essentially what he's talking about, assurance of your salvation. To be sure of your salvation. And we become sure of something when we start living it. And the power of the Holy Spirit transforms us and we see the work of the Holy Spirit in us. And the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And our salvation, we have assurance deeply within us that can't be shaken. It comes from living the life of holiness. It comes from growing in Christ, as Peter says here, with the things that we explored last time. And even nature tells us, or the things that we engage in, tell us that the more we do something, the better we are at it. Now, who's played golf? Anybody played golf? Yeah, I saw some hands go up, yeah. How well do you hit nine irons? Some are hit and miss, some make it to the green, some don't. Let me tell you something. I was at a golf course many years ago and I, um, it was Greg Norman came out for a clinic and I think he was hitting nine irons and he was hitting one after the other and they were all going in the same spot. And the reason why he could hit the nine iron at exactly the same spot every time or thereabouts is because he's hit thousands and thousands of them in practice. So when somebody's lining up a 9-iron, if they've hit it 10,000 times before, they pretty much know where it's going to go. 
It's the same thing with Christian life. The more we live, the more we grow, the more we understand, the more the Holy Spirit reveals things to us, the more the Holy Spirit transforms us, the more we become sure of the things that the Word of God says. And that's part of the transformation and the continuity that I'm talking about. Salvation is not a point of time experience. It's the complete life. It's being the new man in Christ from the time you come to Christ to the time you go into eternity. Gospel of John chapter 5 and verse 24. The words of Christ. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me, has, not will have, has today, in the present, everlasting life. And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. The time we come to Christ, we have everlasting life, we've passed from death to life, with a new people in Christ. Verse, a chapter before that, John chapter 4, verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give, him will never thirst. This is Christ talking to the Samaritan woman. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. It springs up from today into everlasting life. There's a continuity. And what Peter's saying here is that continuity is linked to the identity that I've spoken about, who we are. And let's get that clear, brothers and sisters. We really need to understand who we are. Once we understand who we are deeply and meditate on that, we understand the magnitude of God's work. We understand what he's done for us and it inspires us and helps us transform on a day-by-day basis in holiness and doing the things that Peter says here with the power that's given by the Holy Spirit. And it leads to the point, and Paul puts it in, in another way, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, and I love the way Paul explains this, He's talking about seeing God and he's comparing Moses with the veiled face. And he says, but we all with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are being transformed from, by, from glory to glory. An ongoing process. And it leads to everlasting life. And Peter explains that, and this is the final, I said we were going to touch on the assurance of our faith and going into the heavenly kingdom. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And he's saying to them in verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent. In other words, I know that I'm going to die, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. But I want to tell you these things so you've got a remembrance of them when I'm gone. The abundant entry into the everlasting kingdom. The word supplied to you abundantly, the same Greek word is used, add to your faith, virtue, etc., etc. We're called to add today to our faith all those things that we discussed last time. And we will be given and supplied with the abundant entry into the everlasting kingdom. Can you see how the abundant entry into the everlasting kingdom is linked to how we live today. 
which raises the question, how do we grow old and die? Now I look around this congregation and I grew up here and so I was a little child and everybody was older than me and as I look around there's most people are much younger than me and there's a few older than me and I won't um, point out who's older. You know who you are. How do we grow old and die? Nobody wants to talk about death. It's a subject that we'd like to push into the distance and somehow hope that it all goes well with us and we reach the age of 85 and just drop dead suddenly and we don't suffer. My uncle Chris passed away at 86 very suddenly and he was quite fit. And you say, yeah, that's, if I could take that, I'd take that. The reality is, we don't choose. We don't know. We see our elderly parents, brothers and sisters in Christ, with the difficulty that they face with old age. And thoughts of the life to come. And when you're young, you don't think about these sorts of things because you're strong and healthy and it's just something for the future and sometimes we get these passing thoughts in our heads you know, and we try to dismiss them and move on. And one of my favourite poems by the American poet Emily Dickinson in the first stanza says, Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage, in other words, the carriage, the cortege that was taking the person away, held just ourselves and immortality. In other words, death comes. You may not want it to come at that time, but death will come when death comes. And then we're faced with the question, how do we go into the heavenly kingdom with an entrance that's supplied abundantly. How does a Christian die well? How does a Christian age well? How does a Christian deal with the difficulty of life? Not easy questions. But it seems to me that unless we give all diligence to add to our faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Unless we do that, and unless we recognise that it's all the, the power to do that is in the hand of God and the Holy Spirit provides, unless we do that sort of thing and we arrive at the end... How can we think about an abundant entry when the life that should have been wasn't? The royal priesthood, the holy nation, the new man in Christ didn't live up to that identity. Forgot that they were cleansed from old sins. Forgot and were short-sighted and didn't have the vision going forward. How do we expect an abundant entry into the kingdom of heaven? Paul puts it like this. I have fought 
the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. The aim is to arrive at that point, whenever that might be, with no regret. I fought the good fight. I finished the race and I kept the faith. This has got nothing to do with how much you did for God. This has got nothing to do with how much you contributed, how many sermons you preached, how many people you looked after, how many buildings you helped create. It's got nothing to do with any of that. They are secondary things. What it's got to do with is, was my character transformed on a day-by-day basis? into the image of Christ because that's who I'm going to meet. Is that, do I have this continuity in my life? I realized I was a sinner and I was dead. I came to Christ because I had no other hope. I became a new man. I understood my identity as a new man and I understood that a new man becomes like Christ and I began to live a life Imitating Christ, growing in Christ, a life of holiness. And when we do that, we reach the point of coming into the everlasting kingdom. The final point is continuity, where there are no regrets. I am what I am by the grace of God, says the Apostle Paul. Yes, I'm broken. Yes, I'm still liable to commit sin. Yes, I'm fallen. But I am the new man. It's all covered in the blood of Christ. And I saw the hand of God in my life as he transformed me from glory to glory. And I can stand and say at the end that there are no regrets. I finished the race, I fought the good fight and I kept the faith. That's the continuity combined with the identity. And I finish with one verse which sums it up beautifully from the Apostle John, 1 John chapter 3 verse 2. Please follow this. 1 John chapter 3 verse 2. Beloved, now, now, we are children of God. Now, our identity. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. We don't know what we're going to be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now we are children of God. Now we are royal priests, part of a holy nation, chosen people of God to proclaim his virtues. That's who we are. We're not sure about, we're not clear about, we can't understand and see what we're going to be like in eternity, but we know that when he is revealed, the word of God tells us, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. What great hope. And in terms of what we need to do, what the Apostle Peter tells us, and what we've been studying the last few sessions or sermons is captured in verse 3. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. May God bless his word in our hearts this morning.